Allereerst hartelijk dank voor de uitnodiging naar, naar Kent. Uh, het uh, spijt me dat ik niet de hele tijd uh, Nederlands zal spreken. Uh, maar geloof me, het klinkt een stuk beter in het Engels. <laughs> Can I leave now? Is that enough? Uh, it, it, it's a great pleasure, pleasure to be here in, in such a, an exalted place. And um, I wonder if my paymasters at the Sustainable Development Commission could have foreseen that I would have been standing in a, in a, in a building formerly of, of a social, socialist workers' movement to, to talk to the subject of the report that I wrote for them, for their ears only, for their intellectual delight, for their satisfaction to, to educate them about uh, things that were coming down the line at them. In fact, they saw, I think, very little of that. And the experience of presenting this report to government um, two and a half years ago now was, was, a, was a salutary one. Um, it, 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 it evoked some wrath, I have to say. In fact, a personal phone call on the Friday evening before uh, the report was launched from um, an unnamed official um, in an unnamed department who informed me that number 10 in an unnamed street in London had, uh, had, had gone ballistic um, because, as it turned out, I was launching this report in the same week in which um, Gordon Brown, then Prime Minister, had invited the G20 leaders to London to do what exactly? To um, <clears throat> talk about kick-starting growth. Um, so you can see that it was slightly embarrassing to have a report from his own advisory body uh, with, the, with the words without growth in the title. And I think it's probably fair to say that's the first time any government report or anything close to a government report has dared to ask those questions about the growth-based economy. And as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, what's happened in the subsequent two and a half years um, has been extraordinary in all sorts of ways. One of the ways I think that it has been extraordinary, certainly for me, is to discover that this is perhaps the most important conversation that we could possibly be having at this point in time. Another of the ways, of course, is that we have seen a set of, of changing circumstances. We've certainly done very well at the without growth bit of my title. Um, arguably, we've done considerably less well at the prosperity bit of it, and we've tried to substitute the prosperity bit with a, with a different word. It sounds a little bit similar, but it has a completely different impact, and, and that word, of course, is austerity. And so one of the key elements of this conversation is really to ask the question, what is the relationship between these two things? What's the relationship between prosperity and austerity? And I think what I, what I hope to show you over the course of this evening is that they are two radically different approaches to not just to ecological crisis, but to financial crisis. There's a lot, um, a lot of me out there now on YouTube in various places, in, uh, in the book itself, in a variety of articles. And, and in a sense, that, that's a rather strange place for a, an academic to be. I, I am, by nature, an academic. I have a, a chair in, a, in, a, in a, a small university in the UK. And, and so, actually, to find myself suddenly, as I did this afternoon, being followed around by television cameras uh, to bemused glances from the kids on the streets of Ghent is something of, a, of an anomaly for me. It's, it's, it's gratifying only that when they looked for the famous celebrity who was being followed by cameras, they looked straight past me. <laughs> preferring instead the, the rather better-looking and rather younger uh, photographers and journalists who were also in, in the posse around me. So it, it is an odd 
kind of um, situation for someone who really is nothing more than a kind of itinerant uh, court jester, saying the unpopular things in the most uh, sometimes difficult places and hoping uh, to, to, to draw a fine line between uh, his intellectual freedom on the one hand and um, having his head cut off on the other hand. And, and arguably one of the things that came out of presenting this report to government was that after the government changed in 2010, the very first, one of the very first casualties of the change in government was the commission who dared to give such advice. It's dangerous territory, but it is, I would argue, territory that we have to explore now. Rather, though, than giving you the conventional, the familiar presentation that I've given uh, many times now in all sorts of places, I wanted to really concentrate on these particular questions. I will give you some of the background from the book, but there is obviously more to find elsewhere. And I think these questions for me are the ones that we should be asking now whatever we think about growth, whatever we think about politics, whatever we think about climate change and the state of the planet, these questions about our economy and about our society are absolutely vital ones. Where are we? What is the state of this society today? Where is our economy today? What is the state of the world today? Can growth as a project be saved? Can we save this economy as we have considered it in the past? Can we save this model of capitalism? Can we save a growth-based capitalistic economy in the face of the challenges that we see around us today? And whether or not it can be saved, what on earth would a new economy look like? What would an economy in harmony with nature look like? What would an economy with financial stability look like? What would an economy that gave people meaningful work actually look like? And perhaps more, most important of all, how on earth do we get there? So let me, let me start at the top with that where are we question. And what is fascinating, of course, is that where we are is changing literally moment by moment. We are living through an extraordinary period of history. And every time we think it's stopped, every time we think it's fixed, every time we think we're back on track, actually there are still surprises in store. Last week, I sat in two meetings, one in an investment bank and the other in uh, a meeting of the ex-commissioners of the once advisory body to the UK government. And we discussed in both of those meetings the Occupy Wall Street riots, protest. And the question naively was raised, do we think this could happen here? And there was lots of discussion about whether we could see Occupy Threadneedle Street in London or Occupy Bank Two days later, literally two days later, it happened. These kinds of protests, this kind of activism, these expressions of concern and sometimes rage against a system which has failed us tells us that where we are is changing moment to moment. We cannot be satisfied with the old explanations. We cannot live with the idea that it's possible to go back to a pre-crisis society. There is no return ticket. The journey forwards through here may well be a difficult, a challenging one, but it's one where increasingly the voices of an increasingly vociferous crowd, an increasingly articulate younger generation an increasingly concerned populace is making itself known in the politics. This is a picture of a town very, very close to where I was brought up. I, I had my first date at an ice skating rink less than half a mile from this burning building. This, 
department store that was set alight in, in riots in the beginning of August in London. Uh, social unrest of unforeseen proportions, uh, extraordinary scenes. And I should say, of course, that it wasn't simply a protest about the conditions of the economy. It wasn't simply a protest about society and the direction we're going in. It started actually as a very, very simple protest against a death uh, at the hands of the police of an innocent man. But it motivated somehow an enormous sense of discontent. Alongside that discontent, it clearly had criminal elements. There were an extraordinary number of arrests of sometimes extraordinary young people uh, simply for looting and pillaging. The trappings of consumerism are a powerful lure to the appetites, particularly the appetites of the disadvantaged. And of course, it's very easy to cast that simply as uh, criminal activity. But I think that would be a mistake. There was political protest here. There was a sense of this built on a very active young movement called Uncut, a movement which had set itself up as a political opponent to the austerity program in the UK, and a movement which is increasingly articulate about the social injustice in a consumerist society of austerity-based policies. Perhaps the best summing up of, of this incident that I, that I saw was the veteran cultural commentator, John Berger, who described the riots as consumerism stood on its head with empty pockets. There was a sense here of consumerism both being the lure of criminal behavior, but also the focus of political protest. Whichever way you see it, these were unprecedented scenes, very close to where I was a child, where I was brought up. Their roots, though, go further back. They, they clearly go back to austerity politics. And austerity politics is a response to what happened in New York three years ago when Lehman Brothers collapsed. The collapse of Lehman Brothers signaled a crisis of unprecedented proportions. It told us in no uncertain terms that this financial system built upon relentless expansion of debts on toxic derivatives that hid those debts from balance sheets, on the confidence of markets playing risk against the public interest continually in pursuit of profit, that this system was on the verge of collapse. And there is a direct link, there's a direct link between what happened on the 15th of September and what happened on the 6th of August in London. The response to this was a massive international bailout of the financial system to the tune of trillions of dollars. A bailout that was subsidized largely by the expansion of sovereign debts, debts that will have to be paid by the taxpayer over decades. And the destination of this money was largely in places where already existing interests were firmly entrenched. This was a support for the status quo. This was an attempt to keep Wall Street absolutely back on track. It was quite specifically putting money into the pockets of the architects of crisis. And to pay for that bailout, across nation after nation, governments have had to institute austerity policies. They have withdrawn social investment. They have cut programs of subsidy. They've increased taxation in very specific ways. They have made it clear to the public that the cost of this crisis will be borne by the taxpayer over several decades. And not surprisingly, actually, the public who have listened to these messages for three years have managed to put two and two together, have managed to understand, actually, that the saving of Wall Street, the, the recapitalization of a financial sector which has created its own instability, is deeply regressive. It has 
no moral basis. And another of the twists and turns in the story comes only from the last few weeks, and it is again from New York, from Wall Street itself, and the uh, Occupy Wall Street protests. This is a, a, a photograph from a couple of weeks ago, um, and it refers the dear 1%, uh, we fell asleep for a while, just woke up, sincerely the 99%. This refers uh, to the accumulation of wealth in the minority of the population concentrated on a financial sector that had run amok. And it represents, I think, a significant social movement, not the least because it happened not in wonderfully social, socially conscious Stockholm or social market-oriented Berlin or in Ghent or even in London. It happened in Wall Street at the heart of the financial model. This was, I think, an extraordinary moment in time. And so our conversation last week, could this happen somewhere else, was a very meaningful one. Um, and the fact that it did happen somewhere else, I think, is uh, very telling indeed. So this is where we are. This is the kind of world we live in. And it is almost, at this point in time, forgotten, perhaps, that the entire economic model, which had built itself increasingly around unsustainable financial debt, had also built itself around unsustainable ecological debt. The growth of the conventional economy in the ways that we have seen it with its material dependencies, with its ecological impacts, is profoundly unsustainable. And you probably don't even need me to talk about the areas where that is true. Climate change, deforestation, the loss of habitats, the pollution of groundwater supplies, the decimation of forests, the pollution of marine environments, the collapse of fish stocks. Again and again, what we see over a period of the last 50 years at least is a sense of unsustainable impact of the global economy on the planet. This would not be a dilemma were it not for the fact that growth has also delivered some benefits to us. Uh, and I think it's very important to recognize that. It's not a tirade against growth. It's not throwing out the existing system because it has failed singularly over decades. Actually, a growth-based economy delivered us some real benefits. Let me just show you some of the data on that. And it's very, very clear. This is a, a point where you can appeal to historical evidence, and it's important to do so. This is a, a graph of a life expectancy at birth against income per capita. So the poorest countries are on the left, the richest countries are on the right. And what you see there, and it's replicated across country after country, is that as incomes grow, life expectancy rises. But it's not a straightforward linear pattern. Actually, this is a very, very characteristic pattern for many of the benefits that growth has brought us. On the left of the diagram, in the poorest countries, what you see is that a very small increment in income per capita leads sometimes to very large increases in life expectancy. So languishing at a life expectancy of, of 40 years, I would have been dead 10 years ago, um, you move through development to places where life expectancy is, is double that. But you don't do so at an even rate. In fact, most of those gains take place between the lowest incomes around $5,000 per capita and fifteen dollars or $20,000 per capita. And then beyond that point, actually, the gains to life expectancy are much, much slower and much, much less. And so by the time you get to the right-hand side of that graph, the United States, 
Norway, the United Kingdom. In these countries, actually, life expectancy remarkably is lower than in Cuba, Costa Rica, and Chile. So an extraordinary increase in income for very, very little increase in the benefits of growth. And what's interesting is that you can do this exercise with all sorts of indicators of our well-being, of, of how well we're doing in society. You can do it for life expectancy. You can do it for uh, infant mortality. You can do it for participation in education. You can do it for happiness, for life satisfaction. And you reproduce exactly the same point, that at low incomes it makes sense to increase those incomes because you really make a difference to people's lives. Beyond that point, the gains are incremental, marginal at best. And I think there's a couple of lessons from this diagram. The first of them, it seems to me, is that there is a clear moral responsibility to distribute income better, to allow for growth where growth really makes a difference in the poorest nations. That, to me, looks like a blindingly obvious response to the enormous income disparities that we still see around the globe. Two billion people still living on less than the price of a cappuccino from the cafe next door. These kinds of disparities, when you look at the evidence on, on the basis of well-being, no longer seem morally acceptable. And the second, the second lesson, I think, uh, from this graph is a kind of a puzzle. Uh, and it is this. If the gains to life expectancy, to education, to infant mortality, to health, uh, and indeed to life satisfaction are so small from increasing growth in the richest nations. And indeed, there's some evidence to suggest that we may even be undermining those gains by growing further. If that is the case, why are we still chasing growth? Why, in particular, in the face of that moral challenge, do we still think it's correct to be chasing growth? And I promised you a dilemma and here is essentially the dilemma. If there's something that's opposite to growth, uh, it barely has a name, it's beginning to have a name, it's sometimes called degrowth. In the original conception of that term, it came largely from French-speaking countries, it's called uh, decroissance, which I, I think has the benefit of at least seeming slightly more appetizing than degrowth. <laughs> almost like something you would have for breakfast. Um, but even décroissance, sadly, suffers from this one particular problem. In a growth-based society, décroissance is unstable. The opposite to a growth-based society is not a nice, steady place where things go on, trains puffing peacefully through English meadows as a former prime minister once lampooned the concept. It is not that. It is a situation potentially of collapse, of recession, of businesses going bust, people losing their jobs, and politicians finding themselves out of office. So here is the challenge, that the economy as we've created it is unstable when growth stops. It is actually functionally, systematically built around the idea of expanding consumer demand. There are, there's a lot of uh, parts of that dynamic. I'll, I'll just mention one of them very briefly. Why is growth so unstable uh, when it stops growing? And I want to point to the role in particular of, of something called labor productivity which is the amount of work that you can get out of each worker in each period of time. So for each hour 
Next year, I will be able to get more work out of this worker than I did last year because, why? Because I am doing things better, I'm doing them more efficiently, I'm substituting some of his or her labor with some machines. I'm improving my labor productivity in the jargon. And the difficulty with this, it looks, it feels, it seems like a very good thing to do to increase labor productivity. It's surely in the name of efficiency to do such a thing. But the difficulty is that once I've made all of my workers more efficient, I need fewer of them next year unless my economy is growing. So this relationship between jobs and growth is an incredibly important one. I, I'm going to come back very specifically to this idea of labor productivity because it turns out to be absolutely critical in redesigning the economy. But the important point here is that if I'm employing fewer workers next year, that means somebody gets laid off. That means there's less spending power in the economy. That means there's less people buying stuff from factories. That means the factories don't have to produce so much again, so they have to lay more people off. The dynamic of labor productivity pushes us towards collapse, even as it attempts to deliver us towards growth. So here is a fundamental structural aspect of the economy. And even if you don't entirely follow the language of economics and the logic of labor productivity. The point is this, it is systematically built into the way that the economy works. And it creates, therefore, a profound dilemma. Not an easy place to be. Where are we? We are in an extraordinary mess, a mess of ecological proportions, a mess of financial proportions, a mess of structural proportions, and indeed a mess of social proportions. How do we save the growth project from this mess? Can we save it? And, and this is um, the second part of my, my questions. Can growth be saved? The politician would tell you it has to be saved. The politician tells you there is no alternative. Margaret Thatcher's favorite phrase from the 19, late 1980s, Tina, there is no alternative to the growth-based economy. And it justifies the trillions that we spend shoring up the existing system. But if we want to get growth back, and we still believe, as, many, as some politicians do, that there are ecological limits to growth, how can we ever square the ambitions of a growth-based economy with finite ecological limits. The basic idea actually is a very simple one. If we can't, uh, if we can't do away, if we can't do away with growth, if we have to have growth there, then why don't we make growth sustainable? Why don't we make growth green? Green growth is the new mantra, actually, where there is any discussion at all of ecological limits. And green growth is a forum, actually a useful forum for discussion. And the idea of it is basically that we'll keep growth going, we'll keep the economy expanding, we'll get more and more efficient at the way we do things, we'll get better and better technologies, and by using fewer and fewer material resources and creating fewer and fewer emissions, we'll be able to keep economic output going and still meet our environmental targets. This is called in the jargon, decoupling. We decouple economic growth from its material impacts. And so the critical question, and some of the panelists will talk about it later, the critical question to ask in relation to whether growth can be saved is this. Can we decouple economic growth and continue to decouple it as the economy grows indefinitely? And much of the analysis in Prosperity Without Growth was dedicated to looking quite precisely at this question. The first question to ask, of course, is have we done it in the past? Did we ever achieve any significant decoupling? Take carbon dioxide emissions, for example. Uh, have we ever really done more with less? Have we actually achieved this efficiency? And interestingly, there are two subtly different messages here. The first is a very positive one. Yes, we did. Actually, 
We reduced the energy and carbon intensity of every dollar of economic activity by around a third over a period of a couple of decades or so. The carbon intensity of economic activity fell quite specifically. But what we have to distinguish here is what's called relative decoupling, the CO2 intensity per dollar of economic activity and absolute decoupling. Was there any time during that period... Uh, Tim, you have uh, now spoken almost uh, 30 minutes. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm only halfway through my set of questions. Um, the other half will be faster, I think we can safely predict. Uh, was there a period in which decoupling worked? And here, let me just show you very quickly then the evidence around that. I call this a myth because it is a myth that decoupling will deliver itself to us in the timescales that we want. Here is a picture of carbon dioxide emissions and fossil fuel over the period 1970 to uh, 2007, just before the crisis. And it represents a 40% increase in CO2 emissions. So even though we did things more efficiently, we did more of them. And we were caught in a battle between efficiency and scale. And scale, time and time again, wins out over efficiency. We had no absolute decoupling, actually, until the financial crisis, until the global economy itself began to contract. If you look at the situation with materials, it's even worse. There you'll see the blue line in the middle of the diagram is the world GDP line. And every single one of those lines, except for one, uh, rises faster than the GDP over that time. Not only did we achieve no absolute decoupling here, we achieved no relative decoupling either. These are inherently mat important material resources to the world economy, iron ore, bauxite, copper, and so on. We did not achieve decoupling. Could we achieve it in the future? Well, here, you may have seen this before, a very simple thought experiment. Imagine nine billion people all aspiring to Western incomes, and those incomes are still growing at 2% a year right through the middle of this century. How much decoupling do we need? How much technological efficiency do we need? And the answer is that we need to move from 768 grams of carbon to 6 grams of carbon. And past that point, we have to draw down the carbon intensity of the economy even further until by the end of the economy, the end of this century, we have an economy that is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere rather than pushing carbon into the atmosphere. This is an extraordinary society, a society that we know nothing about. How is production organized here? What are its technologies? What's life like in a society that's pulling carbon out of the atmosphere? We have no idea. But this is the logical conclusion. This is how far we have to go in order to achieve our environmental targets. Now, interestingly, I don't want to stand here and say... It's impossible. Actually, it's good to see a technological challenge. But we still need to ask ourselves, is this challenge achievable in this kind of society? And this is where we have to ask questions about the nature of the economy and the nature of the society that this economy has created. And I think where this leads us to, without going into all of the detail of this structure, of conventional economy is, uh, again, a more difficult place. I want to point to one feature of uh, what is called here the circular flow of the economy, and it's the role of investment. Investment should matter to us because it was also instrumental in the financial crisis. I want to point out how investment works here. It works essentially by increasing productivity and expanding consumer markets. The increase in productivity we've already talked about, it gives us this dilemma of, of uh, employment, maintaining employment in a non-growing economy. But there's another element here that I want to emphasize, which is around novelty. Investment has, in the conventional model, always been in pursuit of consumer novelty. 
expansion into new consumer markets, a process that the economist Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction, continual throwing over of the old in favor of the new. And the one interesting but salutary point about novelty is how much we find ourselves implicated in this system, a kind of social logic, because it turns out we love new stuff, new gadgets, new toys, the best sound reproduction, the best television screen, the fastest car, the latest gadget, the best holiday in the sun. We construct our lives. We tell each other stories using novelty, stories about how important we are, for example. Status is built around the language of novelty. But novelty also, interestingly, signals hope to us. It signals a brighter, shinier place, a better world for ourselves and our children and for their children. So we have created actually an economic system, an engine of growth, a real engine of growth, in which the relentless search for novelty by producers is matched by an apparently relentless craving for novelty in human beings. And again, it's a point I'd like to come back to if I have time, to ask ourselves the question whether this is necessarily so. Is this about human nature or is it about social construct? Is it the nature of the economy that drives us towards this or is it laid down somehow in our genes? And of course, I want to point you to the former possibility because the latter one doesn't leave us very many places to go. But let me just point out that to keep this cycle going over the last four to five decades has meant a, a relentless expansion of credit and debt. Monetary expansion was the vehicle that was supposed to keep this growth-based economy going so that even when consumers no longer wanted to spend, when people were more concerned about community and family and health than about stuff, they were continually encouraged to do so. Building up uh, debt uh, to unsustainable levels, systematically withdrawing the savings from their household accounts. Until at this point, just before the crisis in the UK, actually the savings rate was negative. People were systematically drawing down their savings and expanding their debt just to stay in the game. This is not an economy in which the kind of transition towards low carbon technology and sustainable industry is going to be achieved. It is an economy that relentlessly pushes us to spend money we don't have on things we don't need, to create impressions that won't last on people we don't care about. Where do we go from here? Uh, obviously, to escape to a small hillside and surround ourselves with a, an armed fortress is a tempting option. But actually, when you think about the possibility of that uh, for a world, an economy of nine billion people, it doesn't really stack up. We have to rebuild this economy. We have to ask ourselves questions about the basis for a different kind of economy. Could we have a different engine of growth? Interestingly, this question has been asked, and two very interesting proposals are already on the table. One of them is something called the Green New Deal, that we stimulate growth by investing in green technology, in new green infrastructure, in low carbon technology and resource productivity. The second option, and again, I would emphasize it's an incredibly important one, is to shift the emphasis of our production from stuff to services, to create an economy that's beginning to deliver real, meaningful services to people. So these two ideas, they're not my ideas. They're nothing particularly new. They're already on the table. The question is, why have they not happened? And my answer to that, without going into enormous detail, is to point to the structure of the kind of investment that you would need in a Green New Deal. These are the kinds of targets 
low carbon transition, ecological assets, protecting social goods, creating decent livelihoods. These are not the things that our financial markets favor. They don't give those Icelandic 25 to 30% returns on investment that was so apparently profitable, profitable and so popular before the crash. This is a sense of long, slow, steady capital. It's not the crash and burn economy that we saw before. And we will not get to it unless we're prepared to reform the financial markets that underlie it. So this is an economy that creates real investment in the future, but it doesn't give you back that kind of financially stimulated growth. Interestingly, the second idea has very much in its favor ecological enterprises, community-based enterprises, which can be low-carbon delivery of services, of health, of education, of leisure, of social care, of, of recreation, of renovation of our buildings, of protection of our assets. These are important not just because they are ecologically light. They're important because they strengthen communities. They are naturally, inherently, the kinds of things that local communities can invest in and can benefit from. And they are inherently labor intensive. They employ people. In almost any rest rendering of that argument, that has to be a good set of things for these activities. Only in economics is it seen as bad. This is a graph of productivity growth in Europe over a couple of decades. And this sector, this ecological enterprise sector, this service-based sector, if it sits anywhere, sits in a sector which is called personal and social services. The little royal blue sector here that you can see on my graph. And if you look at the productivity in those sectors over those 20 years, you find that in conventional terms, in the language of the dismal science, it was dismal. They are fantastically meaningful sectors. They really do benefit us. They create better quality of life and they employ people, but in conventional terms, we rarely even see them because our eyes are fixed on high-tech, high-end, high-profit, growth-based industries. So here's my lesson about this new economy. Uh, it does exist. It is here. 40 minutes. It can be achieved. In five minutes, I have to tell you how. Um, <clears throat> these economic ideas, I think, are the heart of it. They represent potential for change that is not just idealistic at this point in time, but is the best option we have to create resilient communities in the face of ever-growing international crises and financial instability. This is a meaningful thing to do wherever you are, at community level, at regional level, at national level, and it is a fundamental responsibility, I think, of institutions to create this new economy. I have a few examples here, but I suspect some of the other speakers might mention them, because in my view, this economy is already there. It's already happening. Shared interest is one example, a new financial vehicle, not so new now, to support uh, fair trade. Uh, the sustainable stock exchange is an idea. This is led by a mainstream institutional investor, a much smaller scale example of um, uh, a community-based fund to invest in exactly the kinds of initiatives that I'm talking about, and Yasuni, a project of the Ecuadorian government, in fact, to pay not to extract oil from Ecuadorian rainforests. These are all real examples of a new ecological economy, uh, an economy that might still be circular in some sense, but one which recognizes the boundaries of the planet. Um, the crucial questions about how do we get there are really for politicians, for those who were the recipients of this report. Uh, policymakers, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the report, asked me a lot, what could we do on Monday? And so I distilled down a list of things into three very simple points, which uh, I thought should make my case very clearly. What do we do on Monday? 
we establish the limits because we live within ecological constraints. We fix the economy because, for goodness sake, it's broken. We change this distorted social logic because it does no justice to us as human beings. What could be possibly more simple than that? Um, it is, of course, more complicated. I gave a more complicated version. There's lots more that you could read about it. There are <coughs> deep philosophical questions as well as pragmatic ones underlying this. What does prosperity really mean for us? Is it more stuff or is it our ability to flourish, to live well within the limits of a finite planet? And who are we? Who are the people that economics characterizes as individualistic consumers? Are we really those novelty-seeking hedonists or is it not truer to say that we are continually torn between self and other regarding behaviors, between novelty and tradition. And that actually, in concentrating purely on novelty-seeking selfishness, we are doing ourselves a disservice. In other words, isn't there a better model, not just for the economy, but for how we see ourselves as human beings? And in this better model of the economy of society, and of ourselves, do we not at the end of the day recover the hope that has been lost through financial insecurity, social unrest, deep injustice, and uh, ecological damage that we have no hope of reversing unless we're prepared to re-examine those fundamentals, a different economy, a better economy, a better sense of who we are, and a deeper commitment to social justice on a finite world. I will leave you with this quote from President Sarkozy. Uh, the crisis doesn't only make us free to imagine other models, another future, another world. It obliges us to do so. I'm reliably informed that he wasn't in imagining other models, thinking about an alternative to Carla Bruni. Um, he was expressing what I think remains uh, 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 a deep commitment, a need for a commitment to a better world, a different economy, and reclaiming our sense of hope in the future. Thank you very much indeed.